Namaste, I am Sagar, authentic storyteller and honest filmmaker who passionately respect the craft of creativity and art. As a filmmaker, I am driven by the deep passion of learning and a genuine commitment to explore the canvas of the real world. My approach involves listening to the diverse perspective of every subject matter, allowing me to create the authentic narrative. However, with this profound connection to my work comes a certain fear a fear of falling short in doing justice to the subject matter and accurately represent the real life story and character that I portray on the screen. As a documentary filmmaker, its creation bring me an immense joy and the happiness is accomplished by the profound sense of responsibility. I am acutely aware of the need to maintain the integrity in the storytelling ensure that every frame resonate with the authenticity and respect to the stories being shared. As I have to produce the documentary for my major project, I have so confused with the story that I am going to tell. I try to talk with the people with interesting stories, but they said no. Assessment deadlines need for the creativity left me stuck. I had no next step and suddenly an idea hits me. And that is a stolen generation. With my lecture's help, I sent them email. And finally, I got a positive response. I'm Rochelle Morris and I'm a Goombanga woman from North Coast of New South Wales. Yep, my name's Ivan Morris. I'm a Goombanga Dangari Bidipi Yuan Spiritual Warrior. I'm Sylvia Kosa, um, an Aboriginal Goombanga woman from the Gumbangira Nation and a Stolen Generation survivor. Uh, I could share your experience or your family experiences related to the Stolen Generations and why it is named as a Stolen Generation. Stalin generation was uh, came about from the assimil assimilation policy. Um, it was aimed in removing Aboriginal children from their families and community to get them to be brought up in uh, non-Aboriginal families to breed out the Aboriginal uh, culture and race. And the Stalin generation was focused around uh, the assimilation policy to do that. Observing this performance, I got a courage to ask this question. How do you maintain and express your cultural identity today? And then they replied. Um, I think I maintain that by keeping connected to family um, and working through what a family's experience of culture might look like. Um, growing up, I wouldn't say I was heavily entrenched in culture and, and the way I would do things within culture, within community. So as I got older, I think, um, yeah, just being able to get that opportunity to, to keep in line with what culture is with family, I think that's been the most important thing um, for me. The way I express my identity and culture today, I see myself as a Goombanga woman. Uh, I don't identify myself as an Indigenous or Aboriginal uh, woman. I identify myself as Goombanga. A uh, woman from the Gumbangira Nation, which is up in the northern uh, coast of New South Wales. Culture for me is really, really important, as from being part of Stolen Generation, I lost uh, my culture, I lost my language, I lost my ceremonies, I lost my language, and culture for me today is very important to make sure that I'm able to get the understanding of who I am as a Gumbanga woman and allowing me to get to learn 
my language, get to learn uh, my uh, role in my Goombanga culture. It's very important. Uh, otherwise, my identity wouldn't be there to know who I am as a Goombanga woman. Um, practicing culture is just pretty much keeping things simple. It's just down to eating, uh, sleeping and drinking water and breathing air. You know, it's just the simplicities and and then whatever comes with that, with obviously dance, with playing yiriki, um, sharing knowledge and just, just having, having a deadly yarn. I approach this question with a deep sense of empathy. Uh, have you too experienced the discriminations or misunderstanding due to the Aboriginal identity? I think for me, the first time I, I kind of um, had experiences of, of discrimination was when I was working in the public service in, in Canberra. Um, at that time, I was working um, within a federal uh, office and um, and it wasn't necessarily in my face, the type of discrimination that I would experience. It would be more invisible um, discrimination that I would experience and, and mostly on my travels to and from um, work. Um, I used to experience, yeah, those that really didn't want to sit next to me on the buses and things like that because of the way that I looked. But I did a little bit of a test and I, I tried to, to put my government tag out um, and see if that would change people's perceptions of me. and. Um, yeah, it was ironic when, when I would wear that, that people would sit next to me and would have a conversation or look at and even smile. So I was experiencing that, that invisible type of, of discrimination um, in those environments. But I, I tend to try and not get too involved in that, but I do know that it exists and it's there um, just on face value. Yeah. Well, as I was growing up, I uh, can't remember actually uh, understanding what racism and discrimination was. But I have had experiences to, um, as I got older. Um, an experience, uh, one experience, uh, I went to, a, went to a country town in New South Wales and went into a pub uh, to get a glass of water. And when I asked for the, uh, the glass of water, the manager told me, we don't serve your kind in this pub. Uh, you must leave, otherwise I will call the police. It was then um, I started to understand what uh, discrimination and racism was for me uh, from that first experience. Uh, discrimination uh, uh, is often a hidden thing. Uh, within uh, for Aboriginal people and uh, we experience uh, discrimination in all sorts of um, different manners and uh, different uh, ways of, um, uh, how could I say, uh, experiencing racism and discrimination. Just the fact of identifying that you're an Aboriginal person uh, or you don't look Aboriginal, or you look Aboriginal, that, that's a form of racism and discrimination. And some of us experience that in today's society. I think for me, you know, um, that I can recall when I was a little boy and um, just going, that, going to the, just the local pools. And um, I think I would have been a bit in, Oh, I was in primary school and, uh, you know, I was going with my sister and, and, my, and, my, and my older brother at the time and when we just use, just using a normal shop, you know, we'd, we'd get, well, I, I, I use humour with this because um, the fact is, you know, we had our personal guards, we had our personal chauffeurs, you know, which were security guards who followed us everywhere around the store, you know, um, and that was a constant thing. Um, so, and, and then later on, you know, even though that we did have our own money and, and, and stuff like that, given what mum and dad was still, 
we were still under surveillance regularly when we, whenever we left our front door. So, and um, I guess that's that's just one little smidgen of what I, I believe discrimination is. And um, yeah, so. Hey. How do you navigate and respond uh, to a stereotype or misconception uh, about the Aboriginal people? Yeah, navigating those instances aren't really easy. I think I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, I guess, introverted person when it comes to conflict. Conflict, I don't like conflict, um, but I try and find those similarities with those that might have those feelings towards me. Try and find similarities and, and I tend to try and make them feel comfortable with being around me. I know that at times that can be a bit conflicting for Aboriginal people, but I think we, we are so generous and kind in our, our time and giving back to people that we just want others to feel comfortable and safe around us in those moments. So I just navigate it from love and care. Yeah, yeah, the stereotype. So the fact that we, given that, well, as I touched on colonisation and stuff like that in today's, in today's society, you know, the stereotypes around that, that, you know, I've been personally, I've got the darker skin on the image of what an Indigenous person of this, of this country that, that may proceed to, not only within Australia, but globally, you know, and I suppose I hear the stories all the time, you know, like from, from uh, my, brothers and si my brothers and sisters, you know, live, I'm either too white in the black community or I'm too black in the white community. So that stereotype that and, and the image of what, society sees as First Nations people of this, of this country, I think that's the stereotype. What are some of the most uh, pressing social issues facing your community today? The most pressing issues, are, in particular in the work that I work in, which is health, Aboriginal health, one of the big things that um, is quite concerning is the suicide rate that, and the mental health within our communities. I often go out into remote and rem rural areas to uh, deliver Aboriginal mental health first aid training and it, it seems to be normal uh, part of life hearing Aboriginal people in the community telling me that, uh, uh, that they've experienced uh, 20 suicides in, in the community over a six month period. And that to me becomes a very, very concerning issue to, to hear those uh, types of things happening out there in the rural and remote areas. Uh, so that's one of the big things that, that is uh, concerning me is, um, you know, trying to combat and work with the communities around suicide and mental health as well as drug and alcohol in the community. In what ways you are involved in preserving and promoting your cultural heritage? I think working in education, that's been probably my key space um, to preserving culture. Um, taking my experiences and being able to give back um, to younger people that might be coming through the education way of, um, of progressing within their own lives. I think that's been my, my key change in community and having that impact and influence. But I think one of the key things as well is being able to, to build meaningful relationships with non-Aboriginal people as well to go along that journey with us. Um, and um, yeah, nothing kind of a, about us without us, I say. So being able to be amongst um, you know, those spheres or spaces of influence and guiding people through that is, is been an important part of my journey and especially through education. Uh, what are your hopes for the futures of Aboriginal community in Australia? My hopes for Indigenous people in Australia is that we all um, have the opportunity where maybe at some point there would be uh, uh, sovereignty, uh, maybe it's a, a treaty um, where we take ownership of our own lives, we take ownership of our own thinking and the way we live our lives culturally, emotionally, spiritually and physically and making sure that um, we're, ta we're there taking our own ownership of how we live and how um, we grow stronger as individuals and communities. Well, it's, it's just waking up every day, isn't it? And um, waking up every day and having another crack of life and um, just being the best, 
the best man I can be and um, connect, staying connected to my to, to my kids, to, to my partner, to my family, you know, um, and doing doing what 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 I, I believe is right, and that's just just living every day, practicing the best way that I know how to practice my culture, which is obviously if it's for if it's Yiddiki healing or, or sharing that, or like I said, it was deadly yarns as well as art and everything, and just sharing knowledge, you know, from different more from different areas. I think that's pivotal for, for for our people. Yeah, I hope that I wouldn't be sitting here talking about why. I think getting past the why we do things, I know it will take a long time, probably won't see the change in my lifetime. Um, I think I heard someone say that it'd be take, take around 400 years for us to even be educated in Australia around Aboriginal culture and issues. So to know that I probably won't be here when that change actually happens. Um, my hope is that, you know, the legacy through my family, our, our future and our future kids will, will be able to live in a society where they won't have to feel shame or, or won't have to keep fighting um, for who they are through their identity and culture, that they can just live amongst um, people in society free and, and loving themselves. So that's what I hope for the future. Awesome. Yay. Done. Beautiful. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>